All right, really happy to be here. And why are you hack? Ask the tough question. Well, to which I say, why not? Okay. <laughs> All right, so I'm one meter and a half away from everybody. I get to take my mask off. Uh, and uh, for the next half an hour, I think, um, I have the privilege of answering 300 questions, um, so do your math. Uh, I'm not going to answer all the questions, obviously. It's going to be sorted by the number of votes, uh, and I'll be brief um, on each and every one with the hope to answer all the questions, but I can't. But I will at least read all the questions in, uh, after I answer as, as much as I could. So 41 people would like to know, and I quote, why are you hack, unquote, uh, and to which I answer, why not? Uh, I think uh, to hack, uh, namely to immerse oneself in a system and think in a way that's out of box, that's creative, playful, and share it, uh, it's uh, just human nature. Uh, and so anyone uh, can hack. Now, nowadays, of course, there's a kind of cybersecurity connotation to the term hack, uh, as if like people find the system's flaws without telling anyone, exploit it, and so on, but that's called black hat hacking. Uh, and very few people who are hackers are black hat hackers. Uh, most people who see the uh, flaws in the system either tell the system maintainer to fix the system or to build a new system that doesn't suffer from the previous flaws. That's called civic hacking, by the way. Uh, and so I would just say, why not? And I encourage you to hack more. Uh, <laughs> um, 29 people would like to know. I was happy to find Polis, uh, which is a um, national level device uh, at polis.gov.tw. So if you take a look at uh, slash ocean, uh, that's our uh, ocean policy consultation, and it all used the polis technology, and the uh, main development takes uh, place at pol.is. And nowadays, for pretty much all the cross-ministerial uh, issues uh, that each ministry have a different uh, viewpoint and so on, we just launch into a polis conversation to ask people what, what, what's your take on it, and automatically uh, summarize uh, the, both the divisive um, ideas, which we just table, uh, and the uh, rough consensus uh, among the different uh, populations, which will just very swiftly turn into the agenda that co-determines the policy. So easy to remember, input, crowd, output, meaning. Uh, and so it's a real-time system for gathering, analyzing, and understanding what large groups of people think in their own words, enabled by advanced statistics and machine learning. And it is licensed uh, under the um, Afros um, GPL, the GNU Public License, uh, which means that it's copy left. Uh, if I uh, contribute, and I did contribute to Polis, uh, then my contributions um, must be uh, made available to everyone who want to use it, and their derivative contributions making um, their own changes must also be published to all the users of their websites uh, to then also contribute back to other people who operate Polis. So it's like all the Polis instances are in the federation and all our improvements feed into each other, into the commons uh, in the social sector. Um, and so GovZero is a very large community. Not all the projects use um, AGPL. Some use GPL, some use um, MIT or Apache, different software licenses. Uh, but all of them must fit uh, the free software definition because GovZero is a free software uh, community. And so uh, we thank the, um, Richard Stallman for coming up with the four freedoms of the uh, software freedoms and also coming up with uh, the original formulation of copy left of the GPL. So Personally, in my copious spare time, uh, I do work on AGPL projects uh, such as Sandstorm, which is another system uh, that enable people to be citizen developers and in a kind of cybersecurity hardened uh, way to enjoy the same um, work, work productivity um, as like Google Apps and so on. Uh, it's at sandstorm.io, uh, but it's again completely free software and under the AGPL license that I mostly contribute to. But as a public servant, though, uh, my work uh, in the official capacity are in the public domain, uh, meaning that anyone can, it's not copy left, it's not copy right, it's in the copy center, meaning that you can just take my work into copy center and make as many copies as you want, uh, and I will never sue you because I'm a public servant, you already paid for it with your tax, I think. So that's uh, my official um, capacity. 29 people would like to know, which coding languages do I currently use? What would you recommend to people who are just starting out with coding? 
Um, I mostly code um, in, I think, text slash plain nowadays, which is writing email to tell other people what to code. Uh, and so <laughs> that, that's a minister job. Uh, but uh, when, when uh, it really comes uh, to the point where I really need to code, uh, I usually write JavaScript uh, because it uh, has a very quick turnaround. But I write with a um, dialect. It was a transpiler, translating compiler called LiveScript, and which makes JavaScript more Haskell-like uh, in its uh, syntax. So that's my personal uh, language of choice uh, if I need to write something like very quickly. Uh, but I don't recommend either LiveScript or JavaScript to you <laughs> if you're just starting out coding. Um, I mean, what it makes sense to learn coding uh, essentially is to start with something you're already familiar with. So if you're already familiar with uh, spreadsheets, then spreadsheet for formulas are a perfectly fine functional language uh, for you to, to understand and for you to use. Um, and if you are into, for example, um, Scratch, uh, which is more like Lego blocks, uh, or if you are more into uh, automating your everyday chores, uh, then there's a language called Sikuli, which is essentially just making screenshots and tell the uh, machine learning uh, language, if you look um, into the screen and see this button, click here, and then click here, and then click here, and you can automate away pretty much everything. Uh, and so just uh, find whatever uh, your uh, chores are in your daily lives and then work with the community and whatever the automation community is working on, uh, whatever language they use, use that language. Because language like human natural language is mostly about communicating with other uh, people and whatever other people use, use that too. Another question about Tux. Um, so given my background, um, I would guess you use a GNU Linux high uh, operating system, this is mascot of GNU Linux, uh, to do all or a lot of my work, that's true. What GNU Linux distribution do you use and why? Um, well, I use uh, Ubuntu uh, and because it's found pretty much everywhere. It's found in the um, kind of internal cloud uh, that we deploy uh, in the National Center of High Speed Computation. That's part of the preset configurations. And even if you have a Windows 10 installed Nowadays, Windows 10 comes with a copy of Ubuntu installed. It's called the Linux subsystem. Uh, and so you can get into an Ubuntu user land. That's the um, uh, user-facing experience very easily, no matter uh, where you are. So it's more out of convenience than anything. Uh, but that's just my personal preference. You don't have to use uh, the Ubuntu GNU Linux uh, distribution. Uh, 20 people would like to know, working for a Thai administration, working with, with the Thai administration, uh, how do we know uh, whether or not V Taiwan is biased or rigged in favor of the DPP? Uh, first of all, V Taiwan was started uh, with uh, Jacqueline Tsai, I guess also Tsai, but not Thai administration, uh, with Minister Jacqueline Tsai uh, back in the Mao Zhe Guo um, um, uh, cabinet uh, that was around the end of 2014. And so, because V Taiwan uses a process that um, focuses on what we call uh, algorithmic accountability, which is a very big word. Uh, that simply means that you can inspect not only uh, the way that police processes data, but also all the input is also published as open data that you can independently analyze and you can independently draw your own conclusions. So you don't have to agree uh, with the police uh, clustering or the police um, you know, principal component analysis. Um, and so if first, if it's biased, then we welcome your contributions to let us know of the system's bias because it's probably not intentional. Uh, and it probably cannot be rigged if the input, the process, and the output are all open. If somebody attempts to rig it, it gets discovered very quickly. Uh, and so this is what I call assistive intelligence. Uh, so a AI that only assists the human-to-human -human communication uh, to restore or empower human dignity without taking away our agency and with the full accountability in mind. Uh, and so far as I know, uh, none of the political parties uh, consider uh, the police-like conversations as ki kind of threatening uh, their own work in the representative democracy because uh, for if you have uh, learned about design thinking, what police is doing is in the first time and which is to discover what people's different positions and define the common feelings. But it doesn't touch upon the development and the delivery of the final decisions and so on. And so uh, I think this threatens no one and is far less likely for the partisan politics to uh, interfere or rig the process. But you don't have to trust me. You can set up your own police instance and do the confirmation. Um, 19 people would like to know, 
do you think that education is important as an education system, including high school and college? What advice do I have for students who don't find education helpful? Um, I think education is important, uh, as in uh, the younger people need to educate older people. Uh, and uh, the, because the younger people, the digital natives, uh, understand how the international collaboration works kind of by default. Uh, and the sustainability um, requirements that nowadays circular economy and so on, uh, I have uh, found that if I uh, talk to younger people explaining that, for example, this thing that I wear is made out of recycled uh, coffee bean waste and recycled plastic bottles and so on, they get this uh, like triple bottom line, the environmental and the social bottom line, in addition to the financial bottom line, almost intuitively. Uh, but for the more elderly generation who was um, brought up uh, by this linear GDP, whatever, uh, thinking of linear economy, then it takes them some extra time to process what this actually uh, symbolizes uh, to circular economy. And so uh, thinking to the um, discovery of neuroplast uh, we do not have to give hope uh, on educating our uh, elderly uh, and our elder generations. They eventually learn, not as quickly as um, you, you folks, but uh, eventually they do come around. Uh, and so education is important, and uh, I call this reverse mentorship, which is uh, why we invite many young people, always under 35, uh, as reverse mentors to cabinet minister to show them the new direction of the planet, uh, and then for the ministers to get the resources required to make sure that their visions get uh, realized. So participating in reverse mentorship programs, in this kind of programs, I think is very important as your kind of social responsibility to teach the people who are older than you, and that's my main advice, is just to work with this kind of social responsibility programs as um, early as possible and build intergenerational solidarity. And maybe you'll find that the elderly generation also have one thing or two to teach you too. Um, so 18 people would like to know um, how much does Taiwan's relative cultural slash norm homogeneity impact their ideas about governance? I, I don't know about relative cultural norm homogeneity because I'm, I'm probably biased, right? I, I'm, I'm brought up on internet culture. Um, be, five years before I even have the right to vote, which, which is 20 years old uh, in Taiwan, uh, I already participate in internet governance in this idea of rough consensus and running code. Uh, and in the um, like Atayala uh, indigenous nation or later on in the Amis uh, indigenous na nation that I interacted with, they have a very different culture uh, and norm uh, when it comes to interaction with nature, interaction uh, with uh, like gender stereotypes and things like that. And they, of course, all have their uh, different um, ideas about governance. Uh, and it's far more collaborative and cooperative uh, than the linear economy that I just alluded to. So I think it's mostly um, about, um, not about diversity, Taiwan is pretty diverse as is, but about uh, the inclusion and intersectionality, meaning that how comfortable we are to be uncomfortable uh, of stepping out of our own comfort zone and do a kind of uh, within island immigration for a few months, uh, as I did many times, uh, and to acquaint ourselves with different governing uh, models and just to think beyond the uh, like single monocultural um, group that uh, we consider, um, you know, uh, our comfort zone. And I think this is um, the more that we do this, the more transcultural we are, uh, then the less uh, this will uh, inhibit our ideas about governance. And the more that we think ourselves as a transcultural republic of citizens, which is my translation of Zhonghua Mingguo, by the way, uh, and then the more um, um, the more ideas we will have about future forms of uh, governance and think democracy itself as a technology. Uh, 18 people would like to know, what's my biggest motivation to participate in politics? It's fun. Uh, so, so right, so fun. I'm motivated by fun. Uh, and back when I'm uh, still doing uh, Pro 6 uh, development, I coined this dash big O fun, like optimize for fun, uh, as a kind of rallying cry uh, for the pro community to work with the Haskell community. Uh, and optimizing for fun is important because fun is, is contagious. Fun is, uh, it makes idea worth spreading, spread more. It increases the basic transmission uh, value of whatever good ideas that you may be uh, holding. It spreads faster than outrage. Uh, and outrage already spreads pretty fast. Uh, and so uh, nowadays, of course, 
uh, we call our counter disinformation strategy humor over rumor uh, for this particular reason because if people feel that participating in public policy making or in building the commons uh, is fun then it's much more likely that you get more people friends and families to work part-time uh, into the uh, public policy making work uh, and even people who are 16 years old and so on uh, they are actually the most active age group the next most active is around 65 years old I think both age groups have a lot of time on their hands probably uh, anyway so the 15 and 16 years old uh, they start a lot of good citizens initiatives on the join the GOV the TW platform which is the national participation platform for example around banning of plastic straws on the national identity drink which is the bubble tea uh, and that was started by a 16 year old and when we meet her um, she was like oh this is my civics class assignment so it turns out this civics class teacher just assigns uh, the this homework uh, for everybody in that class to start something to start a petition to start a movement that will mobilize 5,000 people to petition for a policy change and it just so happens that the reducing plastic waste is really trendy at that time and then uh, we work with the environmental protection authority to make that happen so nowadays her initiative is now our policy uh, and so it's a lot of fun and she actually mobilized more than 5,000 people because they enjoy this idea of solidarity and co-creating with the even the vendors that make such uh, single-use plastic uh, straws and they say you know they're also looking into transitioning because uh, 30 years ago when, when they started working on this that was because of hepatitis B they essentially uh, perform this work like the mask producers nowadays to shield uh, the population from hep B but hep B is cured nowadays so they don't have to uh, insist on using such single-use utensils anymore so they brainstorm and work out a lot of uh, ways for example the carbon capturing and uh, the composing well um, materials or just redesign and render the plastic uh, straws unnecessary. 14 people would like to know, why did I leave education at 14? No, I started my education at 14. And what, it's just I left schooling at 14. And what was the first company I started? It's called Inforian or Zixunren. It used to be a publishing press, but then I co-founded uh, the software publishing portion uh, of it. And then uh, do I suggest people of um, your age drop out of formal education? Yes, anytime uh, for dreams. <laughs> Uh, right. So uh, when, when I drop out, so I said this was a, a caveat, uh, because if you simply drop out, uh, then you may get fined uh, $380 per day because it's compulsory education at K-12 level. Uh, and so when I drop out of middle school, uh, my parents, instead of convincing me or convincing the head of school, simply arranged for me to meet with the head of school to, to explain my this grand plan of starting a company or things like that. And then uh, I just told the head of my school, uh, Principal Du Huiping of Beijing Middle High, um, saying, uh, you know, you, you tell me that I need to finish my studies and I need to get a PhD and uh, work as a postdoctorate or an associate uh, to this great professor of AI that I admire and so on. Well, look, there is this website called arxivarchive.org run by Cornell University and the professor that I admire are publishing on it even before the article goes to the journals. The draft is circulating on archive.org and I wrote uh, the professor and the professor wrote back and because you know they didn't know I was just 15 years old but anyway so we just started working on um, research together so obviously whatever you tell me that I need to finish my studies and get a degree to do is unnecessary I can just bypass this and start doing research and then uh, she uh, thought for a minute looking at the email printout and say okay from tomorrow on you don't have to go to school anymore and I will cover for you meaning that she will fake the record for me uh, so that I don't get get fined by the uh, Ministry of Education. Um, and so, yeah, I suggest you, if you want to drop out, have a good talk with the principal, uh, with your um, teachers, uh, with the faculty, and they can also uh, maybe cover for you uh, and uh, with the, nowadays a very flexible curriculum. Yeah. Um, all right, so 13 people. Um, would like to ask this question from Maurice Du. Um, how do you protect your software from hacking, corruption, 
and people with bad intentions. Wow. Um, well, that's actually three different um, questions. So I, I don't protect my software from hacking. You're, you're free to take, take my software and hack it as long as it's running on your own computer and not my computer. Um, and because I relinquish my copyright, you see, <laughs> either a copy center or a copy left, and it by definition opens up uh, for anyone with any intention to use. There's no um, software um, like uh, patents or whatever other legal devices that's designed for me to sue you if you use my software on your computer in whatever different way. So I don't protect my software from hacking. But if it's running on my computer or if it's running on government uh, computer to fulfill a uh, public function, then of course it needs to shield itself against uh, corruption. That is to say attack either from the outside or from the inside. And for that, uh, we have the Cybersecurity Act that appoints specific dedicated personnel in each and every government agency and critical infrastructures to essentially to act as uh, the safeguards. Uh, whenever there's any uh, attempts at attack, uh, we will do a what we call defense at depth, which is when uh, we detect intrusions at the outer layers. The outer layers are not connected to, to say, the operation technology layer, the inner layers, which is, are often disconnected from the internet altogether. And these dedicated personnel are there. Uh, so so that we can um, do a advanced uh, threat hunting to see what's the likely uh, next threat uh, going on and also be very resilient in recovering from any attacks. And finally, about people with bad intentions. Um, I think it's fine to have bad intentions if you don't act out, if you don't act on it. Uh, if people have this urge to find flaws in the system, then we hire them as white hat hackers. Uh, we, we say, hey, we have this bug bounty program. Program. We have this uh, white hat hacker penetration testing program. So before we roll out this digital service for other people to use, we invite you for six months just to attack the system and we'll publicly credit you for it. We'll pay you very handsomely. You'll get recognized as national heroes by the minister and also the president. Uh, all this so that you don't fall to the uh, dark side which has more cookies. Uh, and so that's uh, just um, incentivizing people with bad intentions to nevertheless do good work. Um, so 13 people would like to know. You stress the importance of open data and transparency. How do you work with private companies like Facebook and Line and require them to give up information? Right, so uh, I work with those, uh, especially Facebook, but also Line, uh, as a trade negotiator would work uh, with uh, fellow governors. Uh, they're not quite sovereign because even though um, Facebook tried to print their own money, um, they're not yet there. Uh, so not quite sovereign, but at least co governors And like any trade negotiator, uh, it works well if there is a strong social solidarity, a strong social norm to support whatever agenda that we are uh, pushing for them to reveal. For example, uh, right before the election, uh, I think it was last year, uh, about around one year ago, we managed to convince Facebook to publish in real time their advertisement library. That is to say, leading to a presidential election, they will publish each and every targeted advertisement that pertains to social or political issues as open data for everybody to, to inspect and only accept this kind of payments from local people instead of any foreign people. But well, I was able to negotiate with them on this particular matter because on the previous election, the control yuan, the, the jian cha yuan, already published the campaign donation and expenditure in open data in exactly the same radically transparent way. And they published this because the civic hackers uh, used to uh, protest about um, you know, the fact that the control yuan uh, hoards this information to themselves. So they walk into the control yuan asking for the A4 copies and and then turn those A4 copies uh, through what we call OCR or otaku character recognition. That is to say people who uh, stay at home <laughs> and look at those CAPTCHAs and solve those CAPTCHAs, they would then digitize those campaign donation and expenditure reports. And so because of this push, then the legislation worked with the control union for the mayor election in 2018 for the first time, published the campaign donation and expense report. And then we say, okay, this is the new norm of the Taiwanese uh, society. So the Facebook, um, 
um, uh, governors can decide either to, for our election, publish the campaign do donation expenditure exactly in the same way as the control UN and forbid uh, this foreign uh, sponsorship of targeted advertisement, or they may face social sanction. And in Taiwan, if there's social sanction, well, it's very powerful and pretty much all the companies cannot survive social sanction uh, if the Taiwanese people decide to, to do a social sanction. And so Facebook said, okay, even though they have not published anything like that in most other jurisdictions, uh, they agree to do so in Taiwan because they understand this is not just a government requirement, but rather this is a social norm. So just approach them as a co-governor and approach them like a trade negotiator and with the social um, mandate. I think the last one is the last question. Um, so what do I think of social media? I think like any media, um, social media can choose to be anti-social, which is to, to promote the kind of divisive and toxic and polarized uh, norms. Or a social media can choose to be pro-social, which is to encourage people to find a rough consensus, common values out of very different um, op opinions and positions. So the um, Polis is actually a really good example. Just like Slido, there is no reply button. So if you see the questions that you don't like, if you see the sentiment you don't like, the most you can do is not to upvote it and then propose something and then uh, lobby for that something uh, to be voted up. But that's the extent you can do. There uh, is really no way to troll Slido or to troll Polis uh, in any significant degree. Uh, and so this is what I refer to as pro-social media. And that that would deepen the culture of democracy. It will let us see that as a polity, we're not that different after all. Even though we have our divisive moments, most of the time we agree with most of each other on most of the things. Uh, and this will be the kind of lower hanging fruits, what we call the rough consensus for the polity to move forward. And now this is uh, 1 p.m., so I will stop right here. Thank you for your great question. Thank you. Mr. Tung, on behalf of KS, it's an absolute honor for you to come and speak with us today. We are so grateful for our students. Thank you for the questions you shared and for the upvotes. And you heard some pretty compelling things today. And as you walk out, I encourage you to reflect on those, think about those, and come up with more questions. Share them with each other. Share them with your teachers. You can probably share them with Minister Tung as well. So thank you so much. Um, and we have a gift from KS just to share with you, to share some gratitude for coming. Thank you so much. And Ms. Rock. Hi, everyone. It is lunchtime. So off you go to lunch. There you go. Simple.